prednáška, tento raz sa budeme o chvíľočku spájať až do Kanady, ešte predtým však už je pripravená aj session, ktorá bude tento raz v angličtine. Tak sa na to pripravte. Jason Halbat uh, zo spoločnosti Tidal Migration uh, si pre vás taktiež pripravil jednu parádnu uh, prednášku. Tak, ona je nahratá a my sa s ním potom spojíme, keďže my tu máme celkom hlboké popoludne a pán Jason ešte len teraz niekedy vstáva, tak sme mu nechali chvíľočku času ešte, aby sa dal do, do pucu a aby dobre potom vyzeral. Tak si užite jedna anglická. Na záver, aby sme ešte nepospali, tak šup do toho. Thank you for the kind introduction. You might be wondering why a non-technical guy is presenting on such a complex topic. And that's because transforming to the cloud is more about people and process versus the technology that empowers our applications. So today I hope you come away with three takeaways. One, that the applications, how they were built in the past, are not the same as they're built in the cloud, and sometimes this is radically different. Number two, the cloud drives a different support model to satisfy the needs of the business in general. And number three, that you need to evolve your support, first through the migration phase and finally to operating in the cloud during uh, that entire process. Today, we're going to cover a few topics, uh, review the promise of cloud, take a look at some migration realities and uh, understanding a strategy to mitigate risk right from the beginning of your journey. Talk about planning your support while you're planning your migration, which may seem a little counterintuitive, but I think it'll make sense hopefully by the end of today. Uh, take a look at this new service delivery paradigm, and we'll explore an approach called the integrated application support team that uh, may be right for you. So let's dive in. Uh, when people first moved to the cloud, it was not well understood. It was like a data center somewhere else, much like co-location. And uh, that led to a lot of lift and shift migrations, re-hosting, Uh, moving their the workloads very similar to where they are today, um, uh, you know, in the data center. But the security is still perimeter based. Um, you know, you the elasticity while available is a bit chunky in that you have to spin up an entire VM in order to uh, kind of uh, spin up or, or uh, expand the services capabilities that you have. And um, Automation is there. It makes it a lot easier for the organizations that need uh, to spin up a VM to do so because they're, it's really done by the cloud provider in a bit of a self-service model. So this is far better than on-premise in general, uh, but now there's an extra layer of cost involved for paying the cloud provider to manage this infrastructure for you. So What this led to is, is a whole lot of expectations that weren't necessarily being met with this approach. And uh, what we were promised really was the ability to develop applications faster and make changes quicker that uh, educate or the agility. And secondly, the cost savings. Um, you know, this was a compelling event. Um, and when you move to, let's say, cloud native, you can see greater cost savings than you would see necessarily with a lift and shift because you're not paying for that extra layer of the infrastructure and still keeping the infrastructure in place. But the reality is, is that there is a lot more than just those application development agility and the cost savings. There's now the opportunity to introduce role-based security and introduced automated deployments to improve that security and the quality of the applications. And that gave us greater granular elasticity and uh, you know easier to maintain and secure applications, pay for only what you use and free performance and security and resiliency Uh, improvements without having to make any changes at all. And finally, the rise of uh, being able to embrace a service versus a server and only pay for the use of that service when you need it. And this promise really hasn't been realized until probably the last couple of years by a lot of organizations because of this data center mentality. So What are the migration realities? You know, at the beginning, it sounds very simple, right? We have these nice 
orderly applications and we're going to migrate up in the cloud and transfer the complexity of managing the underlying infrastructure and services to the cloud provider. And that sounds like it's pretty easy. Well, the reality is it's not that easy, but it is worthwhile. The reality is that, um, you know, on premise, we do have some degree of uh, consolidation, like load balancers in front of front end server servers. And this seems like a very simple reference architecture. Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, that sounds great for the production uh, applications, but there's applications in a variety of uh, environments like dev, test, and prod. And then each of those applications might share a different front end or middleware or pay potentially the code uh, libraries. And the result is basically a spider web of uh, dependency mapping, etc. And different because the what is in production isn't necessarily what's in Q and A or Dev or Test, and this adds to additional complexities here. So now you have a choice: Do I take you know uh, that entire spider web and try to move it in a big bang, big blast approach? There's a lot of risk, and it's a complex procedure to try and do that. Um, or do you migrate those applications on the, uh, you know, certain dimensions, such as the business unit that the applications support or what type of workload it is, uh, what environment's in? There's lots of opportunities here to consider other dimensions. And let's say we choose that second uh, option here to mitigate the risk and improve our uh, success in the project. The reality is when you take that approach that, and this is really the approach that most people take, is that some workloads are on-prem or some components are on-prem, some workloads or components are in the cloud at the same time. And not until you have actually finished your uh, migration of an entire app or app system does this uh, requirement to operate in a hybrid model uh, go away. So, Let's explore mitigating some risks in this approach and uh, take a look at the beginning of the journey, or let's say day zero, uh, from uh, an assessment perspective. So um, one of the best ways to do this is to assess with day two operations in mind. What do we mean by that? The legacy applications in your environment are where all the business values tied up but it also offers the greatest opportunity to unleash that business value by assessing them and moving them to the cloud. So the choice of dimension will be critical in architecting your day two operations. And so if you're gonna operate with them in mind, you have to assess, uh, let's call it the right way or in an optimal way. And uh, the approach that we have taken since we've been in business is really this application centric approach. This makes it easier to tie uh, our decisions to the goals of the business and make sure that we are supporting the processes in a, in a way with the applications that support those. And so this gives a, a rise to really less risk in making these moves. Um, and traditionally people assess with kind of a bottom-up approach and they look at the infrastructure, but that leads to that data somewhere, center somewhere else without having the opportunity to embrace all the cloud native benefits we discussed earlier. So we'd like to say that we should take a look at what the goals are of the business units or the business overall, then look at the applications that support the processes that help them achieve those goals, and then what is the underlying infrastructure that supports those applications. And that gives you an opportunity to collect the dimensions we talked about in the previous slide and give you some choices. And some of those things, you know, might be business unit or the value to the organization, uh, environment, database, uh, you know, you name it. And gives you the opportunity to actually choose which dimension is right for you because all organizations are unique in this respect. And you want to make sure that it maps to what you, your objectives and goals are. So what are the implications for um, 
you know, the operational support. Well, let's take a look. We've just done assessment. We've said, how do we reduce the risk? We take a different approach to assessment. Now we're at the planning phase based on the information we've collected in, in the first, uh, in the assessment phase. So what does it look like today um, in terms of, um, you know, the traditional on-premise support? I'm not saying that this is your organization, but traditionally this is the way that's um, laid out. Uh, they're separate teams based on technical infrastructure, or it's mapped to a generic, uh, you know, technology stack where some people try to get some cross-functional knowledge there. Uh, but it might be tried tied to a business unit supporting all the applications that support a particular business unit. It might be based on the criticality or the value of the applications to the organization. But oftentimes, and most often, we're seeing um, separate teams that are responsible for separate technologies like the OS or the network or, or even just the facilities themselves. So we have to decide where we are today in order to be able to build a map on where we go. So the challenge here is that in routing um, the requests, the support requests to all of these different businesses is a high effort to coordinate across multiple teams. And so that doesn't end up with delivering kind of optimal value to your, to your business stakeholders. So why don't we look at continuing uh, and considering a new service paradigm uh, still while in the planning phase here. So one of the tendencies that we all will have is to kind of replicate what we already have, take that functional support model and map that directly into the cloud. But as we discussed earlier, there is a number of capabilities in the cloud that you don't have on premise that can affect the way you need to be able to support that. And one of the issues is, is that if you do take this approach, um, it can lead to suboptimal migration strategies, such as the lift and shift that we talked about earlier, where you're in a data center somewhere else, or maybe a migration target strategy that involves one of the six R's like refactor, replatform, rehost, and maybe a team associated with that. This can drive a misalignment with department bi departmental business goals because we are not tying the applications to the departments that are using them specifically more to either technology or a target end state. So the goal is to group various infrastructure component uh, migrations so one or more apps moves together in order to man minimize uh, the business impact. And so the implication here is it's necessary to operate in the cloud after that first migration wave, because after that first application you've migrated, you will be operating in the cloud. And many of these organizational cloud journeys last for two plus years, requiring IT to operate in this hybrid model for that entire time. And this is often complicated because applications may require more, one wave, more than one wave to migrate this drives a hybrid model where some infrastructure is still on premise and some is now in the cloud. So now you have this reality of a team supporting applications that are on-prem, applications that are in transition or maybe in that day one support while they are being stabilized in the cloud or they're actually operating in the cloud. So that hybrid support model becomes very, very important. So let's take a look at what that new service delivery paradigm uh, means when we look at day one and day two support after uh, migration. So the opportunity here is to uh, recognize the services that are now available in the cloud. So big uh, factors here are automated deployments. This automation can leave, give rise to kind of the optimal uh, continuous integration, and continuous delivery pipelines. The use of platform as a service using a database, for example, where you're only administering the database, but not the underlying infrastructure and it auto scales up and down as needed. Uh, and then all the way to serverless compute where you're now managing a service uh, or maybe it is a rehost and you've got a, 
you know, you're managing the infrastructure without actually managing the hardware. You're updating the operating systems and, and uh, doing your security patches. Uh, all of these capabilities give a, a rise to a great opportunity to embrace DevOps. And that automation, the code-based representation of how your infrastructure is deployed is a real game changer in terms of improving the quality of uh, applications, the quality of your testing, uh, the security capabilities that you have. Uh, but generally this runs contrary to, um, you know, your traditional support structure. And uh, everybody has a slightly understand, different understanding of what the values and principles of DevOps mean. So day one support can kind of be easy uh, with, uh, you know, the, the migration team that's gathered those uh, cloud skills are now managing the day one support during that fixed uh, period of time after migration and the stabilization phase. But the question is, is what happens after uh, that? Like, what is what is the... Where do those skills go if that migration team is not involved in day two? And that is a, you know, something, it's an opportunity to take advantage of those skills when you're moving to the day two. So the plan here is to identify uh, an ideal day two operating menu, uh, model. And this is going to be unique to you. And it's going to be based on your assessment work that you've already done. And um, then map the existing skills you need the organization needs to be able to support based on this model when you're operating in the cloud in day two, then identify the training gaps uh, that uh, will need to be uh, met uh, in terms of the organization itself that is supporting this, um, create cross-functional support teams. I want you to remember that because we're going to come back to this in a slide or two that really defines an optimal way uh, a successful way that we have experienced in supporting uh, not only through you know, the migration, but also uh, after the migration. And after you've mapped the processes that uh, you need to be successful, you can identify and invest in tools um, and that follows what we generally talk about, people over process over tools. So handing the now in-cloud application stack to one or more operational support teams is where things can get complicated. And uh, it, what worked well in the classical data center to data center migrations can be definitely a lot more challenging when we're moving from data center to cloud. There could be one or more CICD pipelines to manage infrastructure changes that now cross teams because the infrastructure is code repository is not necessarily technology stack specific in many cases. The network config could be integrated with the compute config, which might also be integrated with middleware and application overlay configurations, or even include cloud native components that were previously uh, an on-premises team responsibility. So you have to be able to answer these tough questions. In other words, where should a ticket go for a customer calling about an app if only parts of the application have been migrated? Or does the service desk know in real time what has and hasn't been moved and where to route those on-premises? Uh, you know, which team should it go to? The migration team, the on-prem team, the, the day two team? Uh, these are questions, the hard questions that need to be answered and it's part of the process delivery uh, during this transitional phase. Given these challenges, an approach you may wish to consider is the integrated application support team. This is when we get into the operations, uh, specifically in day two, but also day one uh, during the stabilization period. And it's important to evaluate a number of attributes or a number of activities that are currently involved in supporting your stakeholders in designing the right type of integrated application support team. And it's considering a couple of uh, areas. One is uh, the responsiveness. How fast does your stakeholder need to be uh, 
supported in an outage situation as an example and also what is the uh, impact or the value of uh, that particular outage challenge support ticket that's involved here now this may uh, appear a little daunting and one of the best ways around that is to work with an organization that has already done this type of work because it's not their first time and it will definitely shorten the time to migrating or evolving your your, your support organization in a model like this. So just as migrating to the cloud is worthwhile, but not easy, evolving the support organization to empower this new business paradigm is also worthwhile, but not easy. So you might be asking, you know, how? So I thought I'd just cover a quick uh, overview of a typical process in developing your uh, IAST strategy. Uh, we take a look at identifying the stakeholders within the organization. We do some discovery workshops to evaluate the various processes involved. Um, take a look at the migration strategy that we've talked about earlier and make sure that the organization is aligned with that new strategy. So we can look at this as, an, as a cloud alignment framework, uh, so to speak. Um, there are implications on the organization. Some skills won't be needed. Some skills will be needed, some existing skills and new skills. Uh, so what is the implication on the organization? Identify the tools to support these new processes and implement those tools. And one of the key things to do is to measure against KPIs. In other words, actively measure the entire process. Um, typically, and, and this is where you get the best benefits, is involving you know, the people involved, the processes, the technology, and of course the governance. Uh, and this will lead to kind of a successful outcome where you might see something like this traditional infrastructure being mapped into an integrated application support team. It's very balanced, it's very you know customer driven, so it's really designed to create uh, value for the stakeholders. And each of these cross-functional value-based teams uh, is made up of uh, some of the you know, support and technical knowledge across the team with a goal very similar to DevOps is delivering value to that customer um, as quickly as possible. So these, we've talked a lot about uh, this today. We've, we've gone through um, some of the risks, you know, what's the promise of cloud? Uh, to embrace the cloud usually means embracing organizational change, uh, and that may or may not be the case for your organization. However, the cloud journey, why is it called a journey? It's because it's not overnight. There is a transition phase. During that uh, transition, you're going to run into some compelling events like um, end of support for hardware or software or um, maybe uh, a data center closure that will have some of your applications move over to the cloud without modernizing. Uh, we need to be able to support those uh, in that state. Uh, but during the entire journey, there is a muscle that is being developed. Your migration team is learning new skills. They're, those skills can be transferred into day one operational support as well as day two operational support. And overall, the organization gets stronger uh, throughout that continuous learning journey. The goal here is just because you had to move some applications over doesn't mean you shouldn't continue to optimize them. In other words, if you moved them over and didn't modernize them uh, during that time, always continue to optimize. And if you've kind of followed these best practices and implemented an operating model during the migration, a transitional model, that the products that you've migrated will continue to be optimized because it's now part of the process. So we've covered a complex subject in a short period of time today, but don't think that that should deter you from taking this journey. Uh, the three takeaways that we spoke about at the beginning is that an application architecture can be radically different in the cloud, but that's a good thing. It satisfies stakeholders' requirements and delivers value uh, and helps them meet their goals. So don't wait. Uh, 
Assess your applications, find that low hanging fruit that's high business value and low technical complexity, and modernize or migrate that first application to the cloud and beginning the support. The learnings will be fast and the experience can be replicated many times throughout the journey. The second thing to take away is that, you know, it's going to be a transition. There is a, uh, you know, as many as two, two and a half years from the start of the journey to the, to the end of the journey. And that uh, transition time, if you begin planning your planning process, you'll get the right migration strategy and the right evolution of day two support. Uh, so begin the day two support planning uh, at the, on, on day zero, in other words, as part of the assessment process. And then finally, uh, evaluate your existing uh, day two operations and build that evolutionary plan through migration to operation. And, you know, you shouldn't be expected to have these skills in-house already. It's not something that's done every day. This is kind of a, a transition to a new operating model. Don't be afraid to reach out to the experts that have done this and evaluated these operations to provide that successful outcome. With that, you might have just an easier approach and get those results that were promised uh, from the cloud right at the beginning. And with that, I'd like to thank Alator for inviting Tidal to present again this year at Cloudy. I hope we get to participate in many more years to come. Thank you for investing your time today, and we hope to see you next year. All right, so Mr. Jensen, how about uh, Chief Value Officer of Tidal Migration? And that was his uh, presentation or session. So thank you very much. And what is fantastic that Mr. Jason is with us right now. So good morning, Jason. <laughs> good afternoon, Andre. Yeah, ju ju uh, you know, morning is just for you, you know, because we are at 3.15 in the afternoon. So what's the time? The in time your country? Is, yeah, about 9.15. Ah, it's not so early so it's okay or oh, no. just for okay so thank you very much for your presentation uh, i have a couple of questions uh, for you so is it necessary to use hybrid uh, cloud to migrate uh, containerized apps for containerized applications um so it, it is um the, the when you when you containerize an app obviously you're you're investing in some kind of kubernetes container orchestration system which is completely unique to uh, managing how you upgrade those applications etc and so for most organizations if you don't have any containerized apps on premise then when you move to the cloud you also need that capability and it is uh, slightly different in the cloud depending on what kind of service you use so uh, you can you know, roll your own Kubernetes service. I think we saw uh, Red Hat's Azure OpenShift, AWS OpenShift, Google OpenShift, that would be one solution. And each of the cloud providers have their own native Kubernetes services. So depending on how you choose to my, uh, orchestrate those containers, you're going to need to evolve the support organization uh, to see which of those components of those containerized apps are on-premise or on the cloud. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. When migrating an app uh, to the public cloud using hybrid cloud, can you decide during the process not to completely move the app uh, to the cloud, but keep it hybrid? Absolutely. Um, the Generally, the biggest um, thing that you need to evaluate is the performance impact. Uh, I can give you an example. Uh, we had an Oracle application sitting on premise and we were migrating that to the, the cloud uh, and it was using a backend Oracle database. Uh, there were the, the bandwidth between the public cloud and the, um, and the data center was not sufficient to keep the performance of that application in check. So it depends on the architecture of the application. In the example I just gave you, we did a real-time sync and had database in the cloud and on-prem until we finished migrating the application over. And then when it was uh, in the cloud, the performance issues were non-existent because both application and database were in the cloud. So it depends on each application. 
if it's like the one I just uh, gave you as an example, uh, you know, that wouldn't work very well, but there are many uh, architectures that do work well, depending on each application and the needs. All right. Uh, do you need to use any specific vendor solution of hybrid cloud or can you use just any product for the migration? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, it's, I think the, the, hopefully what you saw from today's talk was that it's more people, it's more organization than it is technical. And so when we look at this, uh, the first thing to do is make sure uh, that your people and processes align with the business goals and that the technology choice then aligns with that. And so choosing a specific uh, vendor solution, no, it's just important to have some way to collaborate on the journey so that all the data is in one place and that uh, everybody that is involved on each migration team, and I'll just give you a little bit of a hint there, it's not just one migration team generally, right? It's one migration team per app. So that, that virtual team that is running that one application uh, may use uh, tools that another application team is not because it doesn't fit the business goals for that application. All right, the last one. How often do you use hybrid cloud when migrating clients' apps? Um, I, I, if I was to assign a percentage to it, I would say 100%. Because uh, as we, as I finished off there, uh, it just doesn't happen overnight. And even in the stabilization period, you will probably be operating in both environments, maybe for a couple of weeks. Um, and some components of an application, let's say that there's a single database that supports uh, 20 applications. You might have 18 applications in the cloud. The database might be in the cloud, but two of the applications are still on-prem. It's a hundred percent. All right. So thank you. It's a question for the audience. Somebody. All right. So thank you very much for your time. Um, that's all for today. You, so Frank. for you yeah. and also uh, from yeah. us. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, so. Uh, Jason Halbot, uh, Chief Value Officer of Tidal Migration. So once more, thank you very much and bye. Priatelia, dami a pani, ďakujem pekne.